Dear students, so today I'm going to talk about symptoms of renal diseases or in other words, what are the symptoms of kidney disorders? It's a very important topic and this is uh, like an entry topic in renal system. Let's start this. Now, <clears throat> in the beginning, let's start with classification and manifestation of renal and urinary tract disorders now what will happen in uh, if the problem occurs in urinary tract now grossly we'll divide uh, those disorders into three big headings pre-renal disorders or diseases renal disorders or diseases and post-renal disorders or diseases now in pre-renal uh, conditions if uh, there is decreased blood flow to the kidney or if there is some problem in a renal vasculature then pre-renal disorders occurs to the kidney like some of the effects of pre-renal conditions or disorders are uh, if there is a severe dehydration or shock then the kidney will be damaged and if there is hypertension or if there is a renal artery stenosis then also uh, the kidney will be damaged okay now what are the renal uh, disorders or conditions where kidneys are damaged they are grossly divided into two types glomerular disorders and interstitial disorders now what happens if glomerular disorders are there I mean to say, what are the common manifestations of glomerular disorders? This is also known as acute nephritic syndrome uh, commonly, but nephrotic syndrome also can occur because of glomerular disorder. Please don't get confused here. Both types of manifestation may be there. The more common one is uh, nephritic syndrome. So hematuria means presence of blood in the urine, proteinuria, presence of protein in the urine, edema. Okay. swelling of the body because of a collection of fluid in the interstitial space which is much more commonly seen in nephrotic syndrome than nephritic syndrome hypertension or increase in blood pressure or loss of renal function that is uh, manifested by oliguria or a rise in BUN and serum creatinine now what happens in interstitial disorders now we all know it is interstitium, isn't it? Interstitium is the space between uh, cells. Now, in in case of kidney, uh, the uh, the functional part of the kidneys are called nephrons. So, space in between the nephrons is called interstitial space. Now, if interstitial disorders are there, then these manifestations are quite common. Like leukocyturia means passage of WBC in the urine. Hematuria and proteinuria we already talked about. Loss of renal function is also quite common. And if the person is having infection of the kidney, like pile nephritis, then loin pain is also quite commonly seen. Now the third type of disorders are post-renal diseases or disorders. Here uh, the conditions occur beyond the kidney, after the kidney, like ureter disease, bladder diseases, in case of male, penile disorders or urethral disorders, both in male and female, and prostate disorders again in male. So, if ureter is having problem, then the patient usually have loin pain, and we usually say the pain uh, moves from loin to groin. Okay, uh, this is a very very typical of ureteric colic. The same patient may be having hematuria as well, and if the obstruction of the ureter or disease of the ureter is completely blocking the flow of the urine then that side of the kidney may develop hydronephrosis as well as loss of renal function now what happens if bladder is having disease now bladder uh, disorders can result in hematuria it can result in acute retention of the urine if the neck of the urinary bladder is completely blocked then retention of the urine yeah, is a common feature in some of the disorders of the bladder especially in neurological conditions there may be incontinence now what is incontinence incontinence means inability to 
inability to control the flow of urine. So there is a, you know, a widening of the urine occurs without the proper control. Now, in penile disorders, okay, erectile dysfunction can happen and in different type of urethral diseases, hematuria, urinary retention also can occur and pain while passing the urine is a common manifestation and in prostatic disorders because of the enlarging of the prostate uh, one of the good examples is benign prostatic hyperplasia or bph in male who are uh, especially older than 60 to 65 years there would be uh, symptoms of obstruction of urinary flow like hesitancy dribbling poor stream of the urine increased frequency of the urination and in some condition there is acute retention of the urine as well these are classical features of bph so this slide is telling us about what are the common manifestations of kidney diseases or urinary tract disorders and how we classify them okay let's move further now what are the cardinal symptoms of disease of the kidneys and urinary tract now some of the hallmark symptoms will be discussed here now if lower urinary tract uh, disorders are there then these are the common symptoms dysuria is difficulty in urination frequency is more flow or more passage of the urine than normal urgency the person cannot uh, you know wait uh, to pass urine there is a certain urgency and these are quite common in lower urinary tract infection now what do you mean by that lower urinary tract infection cystitis and urethritis are called lower urinary tract infection and uh, pyelonephritis and infection of the ureter is called upper urinary tract infection okay, quite easy classification now there also be impaired urinary flow if the bladder neck is obstructed there may be hesitancy especially in benign prostatic hyperplasia dribbling of the urine seen in same condition incomplete voiding or emptying of bladder all of these are seen in bladder outflow obstruction one of the perfect example is benign prostatic hyperplasia in male uh, sometimes even if the stone is there which is impacted at the neck of the urinary bladder same thing can be seen now in if uh, if the outflow tract is completely blocked then there may be acute retention of the urine if there is no urine flow at all and this type of patient uh, comes to the emergency department in an emergency condition they complain of severe pain in the suprapubic area as well as there is no history of passage of the urine so this is urinary retention what is the treatment okay the treatment is very easy uh, we just pass a urinary catheter there and uh, the urine will be uh, will come out and the patient will feel normal now, some other lower urinary tract symptoms may be incontinence or inuresis. Now, incontinence, I already talked about, it is inability to control the flow of the urine. Okay? Uh, it is mainly seen in neurological disorders. And inuresis means bed wetting. Uh, bed wetting. This is seen in some of the children uh, beyond the age of five years. Till the age of five years, nocturnal inuresis is considered normal. But after the age of five years, if a child is waiting the bed at night, then it is a problem. Okay, so we need to find out the cause. Now, on the other hand, what are the cardinal symptoms of disease of the kidney and urinary tract? Uh, I mean, what are the symptoms and signs of upper urinary tract disorders? Now, think about some of the conditions here. These are renal disease, isn't it? and uh, one of the commonest condition is acute pyelonephritis so if pyelonephritis is there there will be severe pain in the loin area and loin area means lumbar area okay there will be severe pain and tenderness as well when this type of patient comes to us uh, we used to press at the renal angle and there is renal angle tenderness present this type of features are also seen in renal infarction and very rarely obstruction of the ureter as well as in case of glomerulonephritis but whenever this question is asked the first answer that should come in your mind is pyelonephritis okay remember that term 
Now, if there is obstruction of the uh, ureter by stone, which is very common in different population, or sometimes even a blood clot obstruction may be there, there will be severe pain which may start in the loin area and it is radiating towards the groin. In case of male, it may even reach to the penile area. So these are common upper urinary tract symptoms. Now, what else? What are the other symptoms? One of the important uh, symptoms is abnormal urinary volume. And that abnormal urinary volume may be oliguria or anuria. Now oliguria it means less amount of urine flow. Or less amount of urine formation. This is a cardinal feature of renal dysfunction or we can say renal failure. So oliguria is classically defined as passage of less than 400 ml of urine in 24 hours. Okay, remember this. This is important definition. Anuria means absence of urine flow in 24 hours. There is no flow of the urine at all. Now, on the other hand, polyuria means excessive formation of the urine okay or more urine flow and this is a uh, classically seen in some of the disorders okay like diabetes mellitus diabetes insipidus chronic renal failure or in in some of the condition uh, known as uh, psychogenic polydipsia okay so in these conditions usually the kidneys fail to concentrate the urine or there may be osmotic diuresis and there are some certain other uh, you know pathogenesis as well nocturia means passage of the urine at the night time okay uh, if we drink a lot of water uh, during the bedtime the nocturia may be considered normal but if uh, the person is uh, waking up three to four times or even more than that during night time it is not considered normal probably this is one of the features of polyuria Another cardinal symptoms of urinary tract disorders may be abnormal urinary constituents means protein is present in the urine and blood is present in the urine. Okay, so these may be seen in glomerulonephritis or glomerular disorders and uh, hematuria is a very common feature which may be seen in disorders anywhere in the urinary tract. So what we discussed till now the let's let's quickly uh, you know revise what are the cardinal symptoms in case of kidneys and urinary tract diseases okay now one important uh, feature is pain loin pain which may radiate to the groin it is mainly seen in upper urinary tract disorders another is hematuria and proteinuria another one may be abnormal urinary volume like Oliviria, anuria, polyuria, or nocturia. Okay, so these are the important features of the uh, renal and urinary tract disorders. Uh, let me add one more here. If there is predominantly lower urinary tract disorders, especially in the older male who are more than 60 to 65 years old, then the that patient may present with hesitation. Okay, hesitancy we say hesitant to pass urine, okay. dribbling of the urination, urgency, okay. frequent urinary tract infection. All these are important features of urinary tract disorders. Now, let's switch our attention to hematuria. Now, hematuria is the presence of RBC in the urine. That can be a microscopic or macroscopic. Now, Microscopic means with gross, uh, you know, examination, I cannot see red colored urine. But with the help of microscopic examination, we can see there are presence of RBC. Macroscopic means it is frankly red. I can see the red colored urine. So this is the meaning. Now, what are the causes of hematuria? There are so many causes of hematuria. Okay. Uh, now let's uh, discuss them one after other. Now, the first one are glomerular disorders, or disorders of the glomerulus, okay? Like IgA nephropathy, also known as Burgess disease, 
post infectious glomerulonephritis familial glomerulonephritis like alport syndrome rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or rpgn very serious condition which can result in acute renal failure in short duration membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis or mpgn glomerulonephritis caused by systemic disease think about connective tissue disorders here like sle systemic sclerosis sogren syndrome dermatomyositis polymyositis like that subacute bacterial endocarditis or you can simply say bacterial endocarditis and even a simple exercise or a bit of vigorous type of exercise may also result in a passage of rbc in the urine now non glomerular causes of hematuria may be tubulo interstitial disorders or extra renal disorders regarding tubulo interstitial disorders infection like pyelonephritis for example tumor of the kidney like renal cell carcinoma or wilms tumor drug induced the so many drugs which can damage the kidney okay and said maybe the important example familial and vascular disorders are some other regarding the extra renal causes again infection stone okay uh, stone uh, in the place of uh, for example ureter okay a renal pelvis inflammation there any tumor in that area structure of the ureter again endometriosis very rare disorders in female where the endometrial tissue is present outside the uterine cavity bph or benign prostatic hyperplasia common disorder in case of older male and even some of the congenital abnormalities of the urinary tract okay these are extra renal uh, conditions now coagulopathy related disorders can also result in hematuria coagulopathy related in some problem with the coagulation factors okay some of the drugs can result in that like warfarin and heparin isn't it these are anti coagulant drug so if there is overdose of this drug then there is a high chance of bleeding secondary to some systemic disease now, can you tell me any systemic disease which can result in coagulopathy in our body very nice okay immediately liver disease comes into the picture here so chronic liver diseases like cirrhosis of the liver or chronic liver conditions trauma okay trauma of the urinary tract is important cause of hematuria and factitious like a uh, menstruation in case of female if they come to the hospital with the complaint of hematuria always take menstrual history and if she is having active period at the time most probably okay not 100% most probably it is because of menstruation that is contamination of the menstrual blood with the urine now look at this picture here this picture is clearly telling us the uh, main uh, causes of hematuria there is the kidney some disorders of the kidneys are highlighted here ureter okay urinary bladder and urethra now regarding the kidneys okay the clotting disorders are here cyst in the kidney like polycystic kidney disease tumor like renal cell carcinoma in case of adult and wilms tumor in case of children vascular malformation okay some of the congenital vascular malformation may be there glomerular disease diseases or glomerulonephritis inflammatory and degenerative conditions of the kidney many inflammatory disorders are there tubulo interstitial diseases of the kidney renal infarction and any infection of the kidney like pyelonephritis so these are some of the causes of hematuria from the ureter side stone okay, stone and tumor and infection or inflammation these are the causes okay you can clearly see a stone here uh, this is called vesico ureteric junction which is relatively a narrow part so stone may, may you know uh, lose there and it can irritate and lead to hematuria regarding the bladder condition cystitis cystitis and tumor okay 
one of the common tumor of urinary bladder is called transitional cell carcinoma. Okay. Hematuria is a common manifestation. And trauma of the urethra is quite common. Road traffic accident, isn't it? Or any type of trauma of the pelvic area, and you know, sometimes even uh, sexually transmitted infection or urethritis can result in hematuria. This is a very important question for the students in the exam. Now, we know what are the causes. So the next step is how to evaluate the patient if, if the patient comes to us with hematuria. What should we do? First of all, we should take a good history. Okay, History should include most of the points which, which we have mentioned as a symptom in case of kidney disorders. Now, are there any clues from the history or physical examination that suggest a particular diagnosis? This is the question we need to ask ourselves and we need to get some of the clues from the patient. Does the hematuria represent glomerular or extra glomerular bleeding? We have to differentiate this. And the next slide is about how to differentiate between these two conditions because our diagnosis is completely different according to the uh, source of hemorrhage or bleeding. And is the hematuria transient or persistent? Transient means for the short duration, persistent means for the longer one. Now, please, um, you know, look carefully here or listen, listen carefully. What are the important points to differentiate between glomerular versus non-glomerular bleeding, which is present in the urine? If the blood is coming from the glomerulus of the kidney, or if the source of hemorrhage is from glomeruli, then there is a Coca-Cola colored or a smoky brown color of the urine. This is because of relative, uh, you know, alteration uh, in the color of the blood. This is important point. On the other hand, she did immediately, if the bleeding is not from the glomeruli, but beyond the glomeruli, then the color of the urine is usually red. Okay, it is frankly red or pinkish red. Now, second one, clot may be present in extra glomerular hemorrhage, and in a glomerular hemorrhage, clots will be absent because the glomerular membrane isn't it? It is a very narrow openings are there, so a lot of blood, a massive amount of blood, probably cannot pass through that and which results in clot formation. So clots are usually absent in glomerular hemorrhage, but clots may be present in extra glomerular one, especially in bladder, uh, uh, you know, source of hematuria, clots may be present. In glomerular bleeding, proteinuria is usually more than extra glomerular one. One of the very important differentiation is the morphology of RBC because the RBC uh, will say will change their shape after they pass through the glomerular membrane. They become dysmorphic. On the other hand, in extra glomerular source of the bleeding, RBC morphology is intact or normal. Very, very important point. And then RBC cast are present usually in glomerular disorders, but in extra glomerular one, RBC cast are absent. Now let me remind you, cast how a cast is formed in the urine the substance must pass through renal tubules okay then only the cast will be formed so in extra glomerular one that phys uh, physiology is not there isn't it so there is no uh, presence of the cast in extra glomerular hemorrhage now after going uh, through the hematuria Let's talk a little bit about proteinuria, another important part of today's class. The proteinuria is a presence of protein in the urine, but normally also we have certain amount of protein presence in the urine, and the amount of that protein should be less than 150 milligram per day. But if it is more than that, then we call it proteinuria. Now, there are some of the causes of benign proteinuria. Now, benign means there is no serious disease inside the body, but protein is present in the urine. So, these are the benign proteinuria, like in dehydration, okay? intense physical activity, most 
type of acute illnesses. For example, a person is having a uh, severe viral infection, which, which called fever, myalgia, arthralgia, you know, sore throat, headache, and all those things. Probably a small amount of protein will present in the urine. If a person is standing most of the time, then also some of the protein may leak in the urine, which is called orthostatic disorder. And even uh, heat injury can result in routine urea. So these all are a benign type. Now, this slide is talking about some of the pathophysiological feature and the connection of them with the causes of routine urea. If there is increase or excessive glomerular capillary permeability to protein, then it is usually a feature of primary or secondary glomerulonephropathy, okay? And mainly they cause nephrotic syndrome because uh, in nephrotic syndrome, there is heavy or massive protein urea. And this nephrotic syndrome is usually connected with poor or whole formation of the glomerular membrane. Now, second point is, if there is a uh, decreased tubular reabsorption of protein in the glomerular filtrate, okay, it is usually seen in tubular or interstitial diseases. Now, let's go back to the physiology again. What happens to the glomerular filtrate? That glomerular filtrate is again reabsorbed from the tubules. Okay, but if they are already damaged or abnormal, then that thing cannot happen, is it? So uh, there may be a chance of protein urea. Another pathophysiological phenomena or feature may be increased production of low molecular weight protein. Okay, one of the important examples in this case is M protein. M protein, which is uh, seen in multiple myeloma, okay, or sometimes even in leukemia. But multiple myeloma is an important example here, and these are the light chains which may be seen in the urine, and these uh, these are, have a special name, isn't it? We studied this in uh, biochemistry or maybe some other related, uh, you know, systems or topics. These are called Benz Jones protein. Remember the term Benz Jones protein. They are also a type of protein which may be present in the urine. And these are seen in multiple myeloma. What is multiple myeloma? Uh, uh, a quick, you know, reminder. Multiple myeloma is the malignancy which is derived from plasma cell. Okay, plasma cell. It is also known as plasma cell malignancy. Now, how we detect proteinuria in the urine? Isn't it? That's the important question. If a patient comes to the hospital with proteinuria, how we detect that? We analyze the urine. And that is mainly done by deep stick analysis. Deep stick analysis. These are the already available strip. Okay, urinary strip. And these are just uh, you know dipped into the in a sample of urine and they show different color and that's how we detect how much protein urea is there so the results are graded as negative uh, which is less than 10 milligram per deciliter okay trace means 10 to 20 milligram per deciliter is called trace a very slight amount of protein urea one plus 30 milligram per deciliter two plus 100 milligram per deciliter 3 plus is 300 milligram per DL, and 4 plus is 1000 milligram per deciliter, or even more than that. So, definitely 3 plus to 4 plus is usually a feature of nephrotic range protein urea. Now, this dipstick analysis usually detects albumin, okay, which is a predominant form of protein which may be present in the urine, but sometimes globulin or sometimes the abnormal type of uh, you know proteins like Benz Jones protein may also be present in the urine. And this dipstick uh, analysis is less sensitive in detection of those immunoglobulin or Benz Jones protein. So we need to uh, you know uh, find them by some other different type of investigation. Now see here, if there is a massive amount of protein excretion, it is always glomerular. But in case of mild type of proteinuria, the cause may be glomerular nephritis, a tubular, or sometimes even some other causes like overflow proteinuria. This is important, uh, you know, pathogenesis here. Now let's talk about some of the causes of proteinuria by the different type. 
So we start with primary glomerulonephropathy. Okay. This is primary disorders of the glomerulo, glomerulus. Like minimal change disease or MCD, which is a commonest cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. Okay. Minimal change disease. By light microscopy, we won't see any changes in the glomerulus. But by electron microscope, there's loss of the porosite. Idiopathic membranous glomerulonephritis or simply membranous glomerulonephropathy or glomerulonephritis is a most important cause of a nephrotic syndrome in adult. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or FSGS, one of the important cause of nephrotic syndrome again, and this is the most important cause of resistant type of nephrotic syndrome. Resistant means steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Membranoproliferative is another one, and IgA nephropathy is, is another one. So these are some of the common causes of primary glomerular nephropathy. Now, secondary means because of some systemic disorders. Okay? Because of some systemic diseases, diseases or disorders. Now, look at the list there. Diabetes mellitus is one of the commonest cause of renal failure these days in the world. And in diabetes, or long-term diabetes, I should say, there is nephropathy and nephropathy is a leading cause of death in diabetic patient. Collagen vascular disorders like systemic lupus erythematosus and so many other collagen vascular disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, okay, systemic sclerosis, these all can cause glomerular nephropathy. Amyloidosis okay, is a is abnormal type of protein deposition in the glomerulus as a result of chronic infection or inflammation in the body. And that protein is produced by which organ? Yes, it's by the liver. Preeclampsia. So this is a disorder in pregnancy, isn't it? Hypertensive disorder in pregnancy with proteinuria. Certain infection are also the cause of secondary global nephropathy, like hepatitis B and C, HIV, okay? A post streptococcal infection, which is known as PSGN, syphilis, okay, triponema pallidum, malaria, okay, caused by plasmodium, and even bacterial endocarditis. These are the very important questions for you in Viva exam. So remember the infection which can damage our kidney. Some GI and lung cancer can also result in secondary glomerular nephropathy and lymphoma, okay, Hodgkin's lymphoma may be one of the important cause of nephrotic syndrome by causing glomerulonephropathy secondarily. Now, there are certain drugs which can damage the kidney and can result in proteinuria by causing glomerular damage. They may be heroin. So in which family heroin belongs? Okay. Opioid analgesic. Very good. Opioid analgesic. And said, every student know the name of NSAID and so many examples you can give, right? So I always ask this question to my students whenever the term NSAID comes, give me a few examples. And many students tell them correctly also, like aspirin, diclofenac, ibuprofen, okay, Selindac, isn't it? Many examples you can give actually. Gold components, okay, gold can be used as a drug, especially in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Penicillamine, in which disease penicillin is used as a treatment? Wilson disease. Lithium, okay, one of the important drugs in the treatment of bipolar disorders. And heavy metals, uh, usually uh, they are uh, like heavy metal poisoning, we can say, like lead, arsenic, isn't it? So this can badly damage the glomeruli and result in proteinuria. Now, what about the Tubular causes of proteinuria and important example of overflow proteinuria. Now, regarding the tubular cause of proteinuria, hypertensive disorders of the kidney can badly damage and result in nephrosclerosis. So, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, nephro is kidney, sclerosis means it's a fibrosis. Okay, so there is a chronic damage done to the kidney as a result of increased blood pressure. And some other tubular interstitial disease may be because of uric acid damage, which is called uric acid nephropathy, acute hypersensitivity disorders of the kidney, okay. Fanconi syndrome, heavy metal damage, sickle cell disease, and even chronic NCDs. 
they also cause damage to the tubules, not only glomerular, uh, not only glomerular nephritis or not only glomerular damage, they can also cause tubular damage. What about examples of overflow proteinuria? Hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, multiple myeloma and amyloidosis. These are the important causes. A hemoglobinuria means presence of hemoglobin in the urine. Now remember, whenever uh, there is hemoglobinuria present in the urine, what is the source from where this hemoglobin has come to the urine? Okay, hemoglobin is present inside the RBC. So those RBC must be destroyed. Time is first. Hemoglobin should come out and increase in the blood. This is called hemoglobinemia. Now that hemoglobinemia is filtered by the kidney and result in hemoglobinuria. So indirectly, this is showing or telling us this is a case of hemolysis. Myoglobinuria, similar type of situation. Myoglobin is present inside the muscle. So in serious type of muscle damage, myoglobinuria may be there. And both of these can cause acute renal failure by blocking renal tubules. Multiple myeloma, just now I discussed a little bit about it. This is a malignancy of plasma cell and Benz Jones protein will be present in the urine, which are light chains of those abnormal immunoglobulin. Now, myeloidosis is abnormal protein, which is uh, secreted by the liver in response to chronic infection as well as inflammation. Now, when proteinuria is found on a deep stick analysis, now, the lab has given us this report, okay? There is a proteinuria present. Now, the next job for us is, what's the diagnosis? Which disease is causing that proteinuria, isn't it? So for that, uh, we need a lot of different information. So this microscopic examination finding are a very important clue for us to know which disease is causing proteinuria. Now, so look at the different example in this slide. If there is presence of fatty cast or presence of fat okay, in the urine, probably it's a case of nephrotic syndrome because in nephrotic syndrome, there is hyperlipidemia with lipiduria. Lipiduria, presence of lipid in the urine. So quite easy correlation. Presence of leukocyte or WBC or leukocyte cast with increased number of bacteria if they are present in the urine. This is a clear cut case of UTI or urinary tract infection. But if there are no bacteria and only presence of WBC, this may be a feature of inflammation okay, of the urinary tract. And one of the important examples is renal interstitial diseases like connective tissue disorders. In glomerular disease, okay, in glomerular disease, how we correlate now? I already talked about this. RBC are present in the urine usually and these RBCs are dysmorphic. They change their shape and sometimes size as well. Okay, And there is presence of RBC cast because those RBC when they pass through the tubules uh, then RBC cast will be formed. Now similarly if eosinophil and hyaline cast are present then some other correlations can be done. These are less important questions regarding this topic. Now you can do this on your own. Uh, this slide is uh, talking about some of the connection, okay, some of the connection uh, between the causes of proteinuria and how we diagnose those conditions. Like if you think SLE, okay, uh, which is an important type of connective tissue disorders, how we diagnose it? By, by checking whether ANA or anti-nuclear antibody is there or anti-DS DNA is there or not. Okay. So similarly, you can go through the connection between these different tests and interpretation of the finding. Okay. Please uh, do not uh, you know, uh, think uh, this is a less important topic, so I'm not uh, doing it. This is not the point here, okay? because it is just a dictation, isn't it? Dictation uh, is not that necessary if there are some correlation or connection has to be explained then i'll definitely do it but you can just go through this okay 
but don't leave it because these are important clues uh, for the diagnosis. Now, how to approach to the patient of azotemia? Azotemia is an important presentation in case of kidney disease. And let me remind you, azotemia means increase in blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine as a result of oliguria. And oliguria occurs because of decreased GFR in this case. So azotemia may result from pre-renal uh, conditions like heart failure, shock, massive hemorrhage, severe dehydration, or some of the intrinsic renal disease like glomerular nephritis, okay? Or sometimes even by post-renal process like severe obstruction of the ureter. Now, how we work up if a patient comes with decreased GFR, okay? Now, there should be approach. Workup is always uh, approach. There should be a certain approach and this approach should be right, okay? So, we have to identify what type of disease it is acute versus chronic. We have to identify the cause, especially the reversible one. I like to highlight this important point here. In case of pre-renal uh, disorders of the kidney, usually the causes are reversible, like severe dehydration. If you give a good amount of IV fluid, then it is completely reversible. But if the treatment is not done in time, then the same type of reversible conditions may result in irreversible damage to the kidney. Now, another important you know, point in approach or workup is we have to uh, identify those indications. Because some serious disorders may, may be thought here. And if we cannot handle them on your own, then you have to refer them to the nephrologist. So why you are referring it, you need to know. And another one, we need to make certain management plan. And that management plan may be multidisciplinary sometimes. You may not be able to do everything on your own. Again, one important example here, if post-renal disorders are there, then you should take the help of surgeon. Okay, urine surgeon and then uh, the good team uh, you know our best team has to be formed there which will take the good management of the patient now let's talk uh, from the medical point of view here what lab findings are important in the diagnosis of acute renal failure acute renal failure or arf is a very important topic which i will uh, discuss uh, in probably in the next time uh, which is an important topic in this renal system. Okay. Look at this slide, one of the important points I'll highlight here. The first one is the ratio between blood urea nitrogen and serum or plasma creatinine. Now see here, in pre-renal azotemia or pre-renal pre conditions and uh, in acute tubular necrosis, which is the most common cause of intrinsic renal failure or renal disorder, there is a big difference. In pre-renal azotemia, the ratio of BUN and creatinine is more than 20 to 1. And in ATN, it is about 10 to 15 or even less than that. It's a very important point. In urine sodium, if we check urine sodium, then the level of urine sodium is less than 20 liquivalent per liter in case of pre-renal azotemia, and it is more than 40. How we explain that? This is explained by a counter current regulator mechanism, whether it is still working in kidney or not. In pre-renal azotemia, the kidney is still normal. The only problem here is the kidney is not getting enough blood or enough fluid. So the amount of sodium is not high in the urine. Okay, but on the other hand, ATN, the tubules are badly damaged. They cannot reabsorb. Really they cannot reabsorb those urinary constituents from the urine. So they are easily excreted in the urine. And that's why the amount of sodium is high in case of ATN. The similar type of explanation we can give in urine osmolality as well. Okay, So osmolality is higher in pre-renal azotemia because water can be reabsorbed from the collecting ducts. 
or collecting tubules. So if water can be reabsorbed easily, then the urine will be concentrated. But on the other hand, in ATM, okay, that cannot happen. So urine will be diluted. As a result of that, osmolality will be less. Another one is fractional excretion of sodium. That is less than 1% in pre azotemia and more than 2% in acute tubular necrosis. The same type of explanation will work here as well because more amount of sodium is present in ATN in the urine than in pre-renal disorders. Okay. Now we are coming toward the end of this topic. What are the, uh, you know, problems of disorders of the bullion? In the, in the beginning of this class, I already talked about the meaning here. Oliguria and anuria are uh, decreased flow of the urine. Oliguria means still the person is passing and the amount is already less than 400 ml in 24 hours, but the person is still passing. But anuria, no passage of the urine in 24 hours. So these are the common causes which can cause oliguria as well as anuria. See there, anuria, there is bilateral renal vessel occlusion. There is no blood, blood flow to the kidney. So from where the urine will be formed. If bladder outlet or urethra is blocked, then urine cannot come out. Though kidneys are producing the urine, but urine is not coming out. This is called acute urinary retention. Okay, and treatment is not IV free, remember that. The treatment here is catheterization, or if catheterization fails, then probably suprapubic aspiration. Some of the severe diseases of the kidney or serious disease of the kidney, which can badly damage the kidney, like cortical necrosis, acute tubular necrosis, as well as rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, can also result in anuria. And oliguria, any disorders of the kidney can result in oliguria. So the answer is pretty simple. Now, what are the causes of polyuria? Very important question. Excessive fluid intake, maybe physiological. Hyperglycemia, important feature of diabetes mellitus. You can simply write diabetes mellitus here. Diabetes insipidus, okay. Now, many students know it is diabetes mellitus, but what is diabetes insipidus? Okay, you should know about that also. Though the topic is a bit big, cannot uh, you know discuss everything here, just the meaning. Diabetes insipidus is decreased amount of ADH in the blood. And from where ADH comes? From where which which organ secretes ADH? Hypothalamus. Okay, very good. Hypothalamus. But ADH is stored in posterior pituitary. That ADH, if it is less, this is called central diabetes insipidus. But sometimes the ADS doesn't work properly uh, in the kidney as a result of problem in the receptor. That is called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And what is the role of ADS? It will reabsorb water only. So if water cannot be uh, reabsorbed from the tubules, then that urine is very, very diluted, resulting in polyuria. Very simple explanation. Another condition may be interstitial renal disease. Okay, we are aware the problem of uh, counter current regulatory mechanism, and drugs like lithium and diuretics can result in polyuria. These are important causes. One of the causes which which I uh, did not mention there is called psychogenic polydipsia, where the person keep on drinking water, thinking that. Uh, they need to drink water all the time. So of course, when you drink more water, then there will be more formation of the urine and that urine is very diluted. At the end, I have prepared some questions from this topic, okay? Please solve these questions, uh, go through the topics, go through this video and solve these questions on your own. If you are confident to solve these questions, then uh, you should think you have done well in this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, I will uh, make some other topics from kidney, kidney system or renal system. Thank you.